Lord, help us to hear you this morning. To help us, Lord, this morning, maybe break some chains in our thinking and in our being. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Well, this is uh, my first uh, Sunday to be uh, speaking at the front since uh, my annual leave. I know I was here last Sunday, but this is my first full week back in the office. Interesting would be the way to describe my first week. I, uh, I walked into my office now, I know I walked in on Sunday, but really I sort of walked in as such as I would see into my office here. I walked in after three weeks away, took one look at it and went, boy, that's really messy. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor David. Anyway. Stuff had been given, this is, by the way, I'm not moaning here, all right? So just hear this carefully, all right? I'm not moaning. But it's amazing how over time stuff gets given to you. Can you sort of deal with this, please? And I sort of think, yes. And I sort of put it in the office going, I have no idea what to do with it. I will deal with it later. And then more stuff comes. And the stuff you've already got there, you sort of shift to one side to allow that stuff to come. Sometimes I take stuff that's my own stuff and then go, on, well, I need to do something with this and I need to put it somewhere, but I haven't got a clue. So I sort of shift everything else around. Will it fit there and then that will fit on top of that and that will go on there and that will do. And then you suddenly get these magazines and comics and you go, oh, I haven't got, oh, well, I'll shove that under that table there and... <laughs> you appear after three weeks to find a rack of post on your desk. Rack a post on your desk and you're going, oh, right, yeah, that's for so-and-so. I've got to deal with that. Oh, I'll deal with that later. Stick that on the in-tray. And then you realise the in-tray and actually the in-tray hadn't been dealt with for three weeks. Do you see the point? So I walked into my office and I thought, boy, what a mess. It's that sort of you walk in for the first time with fresh eyes and see for reality what it looks like on the inside. And that's exactly what happened for me. Well, Monday morning that was. And I thought, can't do anything with it at the moment. So I'll carry on going. So I'm sitting at my desk trying to work. And, and I must admit, my heart did sink somewhat that Monday morning. But time to sort it out, I'll do it at a later date. So I haven't had time. And that's what been my excuse prior to my holiday. I've just not got the time. Which is probably true on one aspect, but probably not on others if I'd put it in my diary in advance, sort office out. And also it's a place, it's meant to be a place of where people come in and I talk to them and it's meant to be a place of tranquility in there. For those that have been in my office who've seen the yellow sofa, yeah, it's meant to be a place that you come in and think, oh, bright sunshine, let's sit in this and chat to Warren. But it gets you after a while. Anyway, so there I am, Monday morning, you're going to hear my Monday morning, by the way, just thought you'd like to know. Uh, I spent about two hours going through emails, got frustrated. We try and catch up with three weeks' worth of emails. I hadn't caught up with them all. That was just two hours' worth dealing with. And then I thought, oh, I've got to prepare for this Sunday for the sermon. I had it in my diary to do it in the afternoon. I better get on with it. So there I am. And normally what happens is, obviously, you, you spend time preparing for this by listening to God. That's always a good start to preparing a sermon. Lord, what do you want to say this morning? These are your people. This is your church. What would you like to communicate to them? So there I am, sat in my bright yellow sofa. I like the colour yellow. I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> and um, so I just sat there. Right, let's go. Let's go. Come on, let's keep going. 
And I don't always pray with my eyes shut. I'm one of these people that tends to have my eyes open as well. And I just couldn't get my mind to settle and focus on God. Because of the mess in the office. That's all I kept seeing was the mess. I was frustrated with the mess. It really shouldn't have been there. I needed to sort it out. So I thought, right, blow the sermon. It's all right, you can say that occasionally, it's all right. But it's no good wasting your time working around something if you can't concentrate fully, is it? You have to sort of say, that's it, forget it, let's walk away from it for a bit. So I thought, blow the sermon, let's get on with sorting out some of this mess. I'm sure it can't take very long. So there I am, looking at stuff, picking up a bag. And I went, what is in this? Who gave this to me? Seriously. <laughs> I thought, somebody gave me this plastic bag. Well, so I pull it out. I thought, there's just rubbish in this. And I don't mean that in a rude manner. It literally was rubbish now. It had been stuff that had been used. Uh, I think people had gone, oh, just in case, let's try and keep the last bits of it and maybe reuse it at a later date. The problem was it was stuff that dries out the minute it's cracked open. So there it is in this bag that's been literally, as you walk in that door, well, let's try and sort of show you what it would look like. Imagine this is the door to my office. This is the wall and there's my desk. And that, do you see, I'll flip the office around a bit. But I literally walk in and it'll be sitting there. And I kid you not, you walk in through the door and you sort of go, oh yeah, got to sort of avoid the rubbish. And then sort of get round to, I'm not exaggerating this, am I, Pastor David, at all. So get round the office, go into the desk, and sit down. And now my desk is not a set of drums. But, and just get around the mess. And there was this first bag. So I thought, fine, it's rubbish. What am I doing with this? Right, throw it in my bin. Ah, bin, full. Right, okay, go get plat sack from the... <laughs> Had an empty bin prior to going on holiday. Right to the desk, come back and emptied it. And that's what I spent majority of my time doing, was picking up stuff, going, this is junk. Or then picking it down, picking a whole bag down to one thing. That thought, oh yeah, well that's useful, that you have to keep. Does this resonate with anyone so far? Yes, yes thought it would, good. And then I started coming across stuff that, 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 is, that is my stuff that's in the office and sat there for the last eight plus years. Some stuff I've inherited from previous office occupants. Um, I don't know if they really are you, Chris, but I'm just looking at you just for a laugh. Um, Chris, if you didn't know, used to be the admin person in his office years ago. So anyway, but it's not Chris's fault. Did I make that sound too long, Chris? Years ago, yeah? No, okay. It wasn't really Chris, I'm just, just having a laugh because she's here. So, but there's just stuff in the office. So I'm, I'm, I'm then going through my stuff and thinking, okay, why am I keeping this? Why is this here? It's always been here. But it's obsolete, it's out of date, it's, it's no longer relevant to today or to anything in the office. I kid you not, instructions to a keyboard, I mean a typewriter. Why is that? Yeah, I did find them. Do you want them, mate? Yeah. yeah, they're no longer in the office, they're somewhere in a palliative bin, probably at Greenford Recycling now, hopefully. But I'm like, oh no, they're in the recycling box at the moment, ready to go. But I'm, I sat, but there was, that's just one little thing. There was lots of big books, I'm thinking, and just gadgets. And I'm thinking, why? Because it's always been here, and there's always that sense of just in case. My work shed in my house is full of stuff that was just in case. There's a loft, isn't there, in most people's houses that's of just in case. <laughs> Nicely omitted. <laughs> Who are you stitching up there, Eunice? Is that Jibs there? <laughs> Just on a, 
You're all right, Jibs. You're all right, brother. You're okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I get a funny feeling there's going to be a conversation this afternoon, Jibs. Um, but there's also, you know, people, I mean, people actually even rent storage space just in case. Give me a break. So, there we are. Do you want a proper sermon? This is it. This is all you're getting. Right, so there you go. So there I am clearing it out. Spent, spent a good chunk of time clearing out this office. It looks much neater now, doesn't it, Pastor David? It does. Thank you. Thank you, Timmy. Thank you. Good. Those who have been in there this week No, it looks much, much neater. You can actually now walk in. Well, you couldn't till yesterday to a new stand had been delivered for the musicians. But you could just walk in clearly straight to my desk. It's like, it's like heaven. A bit worrying if heaven looks like my office. Anyway. <laughs> but the point I'm getting, so why I'm clearing out, don't panic, why I'm clearing out in the back of my brain is sermon, sermon, must prepare a sermon. What time do I have this week to prepare the sermon? Must diuretize it, must stretch it out. But whilst I was there and doing that, I heard God talking to me about today. I was reminded of two things. One was a Bible passage, and others was actually words from the prophecies at the back, as I was clearing out. The passage I'm going to read to you is Mark chapter 7, 1 to 13. I warn you now, we are not going to go through it in depth, uh, because it's not appropriate for this particular talk today. But we'll have a brief outlook. Mark chapter 7, 1 to 13. One day, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They noticed that some of his disciples failed to follow the Jewish ritual, ritual of hand washing before eating. The Jews, especially the Pharisees, do not eat until they have poured water over their cupped hands as required by their ancient traditions. Similarly, oh, they don't eat anything from the market until they immerse their hands in water. This is but one of the many traditions that they have clung to, such as their ceremonial washing of cups, pitchers and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of religious law asked him, why don't your disciples follow age-old tradition? They eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony. Jesus replied, You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you, for he wrote, These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship, their worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. For you ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. Then he said, you, skiff, you skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold on to your own tradition. For instance, Moses gave you this law from God. Honour your father and mother. And anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. But you say it's all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you, for I have vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. In this way, you have let them disregard their needy parents. And so you cancel the word of God in order to hand down your own tradition. And this is only one example among many others. Makes cheerful reading, doesn't it? Here, there is a battle between the Pharisees and Jesus talking over oral tradition. Their view and interpretation of Old Testament law in practice then, in their day. As I said, I haven't got time to read the whole passage, so we're going to pick one or two, uh, not read the whole passage, but study the whole passage. We're going to unpick as we go along. Again, Jesus stood closer to foundational beliefs of the Pharisees than anybody else, but clearly not in practice when it comes to oral tradition. Now, I am not 
going to break down the full differences. Who was here last week? Do you remember the three, sorry, the three chaps, two weird and one good looking at the front? No, 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 wrong good looking one, he's here. For those who don't get the... <laughs> Clearly I'm kidding. But the breakdown that Kevin made of the differences between the Pharisee and the Sadducee and the Christian, Barry being a really good Christian, do you remember that? He did that so well, I am not going to sit here, I'm breaking it all over again. We'll be here all day. But I will just say this, that the Pharisees really believed in, for want of a better phrase, in what we do today, which is look at the Bible, they looked at the Old Testament, Look at the laws of the Old Testament, the rules and the instructions. Took that, then took it into their practice of their day. And what does that actually look like? How does that play out today? So we might look at something and sort of say, um, well, let's just take taking the offering, for instance. What does that look like? Is it 10%? Is it these days now it's between you and God, how much you give? Actually, is it actually really any of it your money or is it what God's given you? And how that works out in practice. And they called that the oral tradition and it then became rules for them. Do you see what I mean? One example was about how many steps you could walk on Sabbath before it then became travelling. You could only travel, you weren't allowed to travel on Sabbath. So how many steps could you do? And if you went beyond that, you're now travelling, you're actually working and you've broken the Sabbath rules. It's that strict. But they also uh, wash their hands in a really deep way to look pure, to wash the outside to make them look pure. To give you an idea of how they saw things as uncleanliness was that um, it was called the Mishnah, by the way, their oral tradition, how it was written down. We have the Aramaic language. They thought that Aramaic, the language, Aramaic sections of Daniel and Ezra rendered the hands of anyone who touched the scrolls in Aramaic as unclean. That's how they thought. So, you know, how we take the Bible. So you take the Old Testament. They're in scrolls. They weren't in nice bound books where it's easy or on iPhones or Samsung or smartphones or any other make, not wishing to advertise but not all scripture obviously we you know we read it in English don't we just a slight shock to you just in case you don't know but you know the Bible wasn't written in English in the first place I know some people somehow think that's the original language it wasn't it's in lots of different languages and it was in Aramaic as well and the Pharisees sort of thought with the oral tradition uh, sorry with uncleanliness that if you touched anything that was the book of Ezra or Daniel that was written in Aramaic, it's interpreted into Aramaic. If you touch that, you became unclean. Now, you might have done if it was dusty, but not religiously unclean, where you had to then go through purification, getting yourself cleansed before God. Do you see the point? Who thinks that's a rather strict and a rather daft? There you go. But on the other hand, translation of an Aramaic section of scripture into Hebrew then made that section clean. Do you see the point? And we're all sitting there going, oh God, it's ridiculous. Let's start unpacking ourselves, shall we? And wonder what we decide. Because I would suggest, because this was not about religious practice, this was about cultural practice. This is how they saw things culturally. They, did, they forgot what it's actually said in the Old Testament. And here is this argument. So here's a question for you, and it's a real question. And I want you to ponder before you raise your hands. How do we practice, notice this practice, a view of things or practice things that we believe, I'm trying to phrase the question correctly, bear with me a minute. We actually see things that are unclean when God says, no, they're clean. Things that we can't touch, or people. In practice, if you think about it, 
Who do you think you might actually consider or what thing you might consider unclean before God? I hope I don't, but when you see people uh, begging on the street who clearly have not been able to have access to uh, personal care um, and or even just the fact that they're begging, whether they're clean or not looking clean um, physically, people may think, turn away from them or, you know, why, why are they there? Well, it must be their fault, you know. Yeah. They're just conning us. Okay. What about... Let's uh, try and unpack this. Uh, let's be helpful. Um, remember when the first Harry Potter book came out? Oh, that was a bit of a ripple. When the first Harry Potter book came out, oof, did the Christian community, or a chunk of it, kick up off in uproar? All to the point of when you've got people that really banged on about how evil it was and terrible, and it's about magicians and sorcery, and it's all demonic and all of that. Then when you turn around and say, have you read it? Oh, no, I wouldn't touch that. It's unclean. So Satan. Do you see the point? Yeah. How do you know unless you read it? What else? I could have talked about the life of Brian, but that's even before my time. I was thinking when you when somebody sin, you feel outweighs yours. So, you know, something that they've done that's Worse than yours, sometimes we, we take those people as unclean. True, and we don't go near them. Yeah. We actually avoid them. Because we don't want to be associated with them. Is watching Star Trek, Star Trek unclean? No, that's holy, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> I keep trying to explain to this church that, you know, you're not going to get in unless you know Star Trek. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. Sorry, do apologise. Coming on through. I think sometimes um, books of other religions, like people thinking about touching the Quran, is that unclean and wrong as a Christian? What about going to places like pubs and clubs where yeah. there are non-Christian people? Would it rub off on you? Yeah. And it might rub off on you because it might actually change you for being a better Christian because you'd actually learn what it, where Jesus probably would have gone or would have done in our day. Uh, reading horoscopes. Okay. I would consider... Who, yeah, go on. Uh, sort of like, like how, as Christians, you know, being good and everything, <laughs> good Christians, we will read our Bible. People read their horoscopes every day and well, then they take it further than that, you know, seances and whatever else, you know, like, um, what's the other things? Uh Palm reading, tarot cards and all that. But those I would consider that we should consider um, unclean. We shouldn't go anywhere near those because with those we open ourselves up to. I really want to pick out things that we consider to be unclean. Actually, we're wondering, is God saying it's unclean? Um, in some environments, uh, maybe for, uh, Christians drinking alcohol could be seen badly or even listening to songs that are not Christian songs. Uh, could also and then define a Christian song. Yeah. I think Halloween's dirty. Okay, thank you. Going to a mosque or temple, Hindu temple. People consider that unclean? Yes. Okay, thank you. Going to a temple. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Eating pork. Eating pork. <laughs> 
This is one thought uh, uh, got me thinking is that, uh, you know, like during the Christmas time, uh, the whole Christian community in the world, they celebrate Christmas. But I do get a message and also a lot of people saying that Christians are actually celebrating Santa Claus rather than, you know, rather than, you know, the birth of Christ. You know, we actually save this world of the sin. So I think in my, in, in, a, in a way, I think, I don't know whether people should think that is unclean or... Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah, I've said to... I've got stuff here which we view as... Might view, and you've said it in one of them. And actually, somebody being fired from a company... Back in the old days, somebody got fired from your company. It's amazing how many people never made contact with them afterwards. You want to be associated with them, and you have no idea why they got fired. Well, certain fictional books I've written down. Star Trek, Star Wars, clean. It's in the Bible, absolutely. <laughs> Space is in the Bible. Thank you. It does say stars in the Old Testament. It talks about trekking across the land later on. So I combine the two together and we're all right. No, joking, clearly. But I think we actually have to unpack. Do we consider ourselves clean unless we've been through certain ritual practices? Some people actually feel they can't talk to God that day particularly because they've not read their Bible verse for that morning. Or they've not actually spent time, what they would normally consider on a normal day, every day. And when they've broken that routine for circumstances beyond their control, they struggle for the rest of the day. <gasps> I'm not clean before God because I have not done this. Which I would normally do. Just lodge that in your background. There's also the other issue, as I said here, was about traditions with the Pharisees. They overlaid traditions and practices over and above what they considered. Jesus, when he's talking here, says, For you ignore God's law and substitute your own tradition. You skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold to your own tradition. And of course then Jesus talks about the law from Moses, honour your father and your mother. But then he talks about, but you say it's all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you. For I vow to give to God what I've given, what I would have given to you. What's Jesus talking about? I just want to break that down just very briefly. Corbin, it is known as, it's sort of an offering. It was a particular practice of you devoting particular goods to the Lord. In this example, a son has devoted his property to the Lord. Therefore, upon his death, his property will be given to the temple. But whilst he's alive, he benefits from his property. So it's almost very simply, we'll try and make this a little bit easy. It's very simply, it's almost like doing a will. You know, you're living in your house and your property and you, you will it to your, to your next, your heir, whoever's going to inherit your property. But of course, you carry on benefiting from your property. You've told that person, you will get this upon my death but you carry on benefiting, don't you, yeah? It's very similar up to a point. But here, the parents are clearly in need and desire, but he's going, can't help you, sorry. Upon my death, it goes to the temple. You get none of it. I cannot give you anything of it now, neither, because I vowed it to the Lord. I've given it away. But the issue happens to be here, as Manson puts it, a man has actually gone through the formality of vowing something to God, not that he may give it, to God really but in order to prevent from some other person having it 
So it's not done out of love motive to the Lord. It's done out of, I'm going to deny it from somebody else and look holier than thou. But what is also interesting here for Jesus is having a go is that the priests were well known from discouraging anybody from reversing. So when they've corboned something, when they've said, vowed this to the temple, they discourage you from revoking that vow at a later date. And I can imagine the things that were said. God will not love you anymore. I overdo the Pharisees slightly. I do them a slight disservice. But you can imagine how it happens. And how many people think like that? If I've not given in my, excuse me, Timmy, if I've not given in my offering, God doesn't love me this week. Timmy won't. But God will. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Timmy doesn't even know. Look, God even moved the heart of HMRC. But it's that sort of tradition, that sort of overlaying of, well, we've always, this is the way it happens, and that's what we have to do. This is how we walk with God. Who's like that? I want you to think about your own life just for a minute. The whole point of my office example, if you hadn't picked it up, was sometimes we have to take time out and look at ourselves. With God, not condemning, but with God to find out actually what are we like? Do we stick to practices? Who's come in this morning and sat in basically the same chair or the same rough area they do every Sunday? <laughs> yeah, well clearly me as well, yeah, I mean, you know, and this line over here. And... Why? Why? It's comfortable. Thank you, Jane, for your honesty. You're at the right distance to me to see you from. <laughs> Flattery will get you nowhere. <laughs> Not too close. <laughs> We're going to have a word later. Right, anyway. I think it's to do with comfort. You feel comfortable in that place, that space. That's your comfort zone, as it's called, that old adage, this is my place. And I think that's what happens with tradition, is that we're comfortable with it. With the Pharisees, there's an image for me with them that actually, the reason that they overlaid a lot of these traditions and rules and regulations was because they were comfortable. You knew your ritual, they knew their ritual practice through the week, through the festivals. They understood how, for them, they walk their life. Well, this is what we do today. If I'm about to eat, I must pour, dip my hands in and do this. How many people, just before they eat dinner, actually, I will wash, not knocking this, this is good hygienic practice, but I wash my hands. And some people go, oh, no, I can't, you know. We have practices that we actually don't realise we do naturally. First thing in the morning when you're waking up and getting out of bed. Who has a particular order of way of getting ready for the day? Mm. Yeah? Yes. Nothing wrong with it. I'm just saying you have it. But you don't think about it because you just do it. And it's the same in our walk with God and Christ is that sometimes there are things in our lives that we do that we think this is what God wants now. This is our tradition. This is my practice. And we do it naturally without actually really thinking about it. We sometimes have to actually look in, back at, almost sort of walk out of our self, walk out of the office, and then go back into it three weeks later to see, actually, there's a mess here. There's things here that shouldn't be here anymore. Why is it here? I need to chuck it out. I've got brand new books, brand new commentaries that actually can't fit on my shelves at the moment. Why? So I've got stuff that shouldn't 
be there. I actually don't know some of the titles of the books because I can't read them properly because of the way they're stacked at the moment. The same goes with us. Sometimes we need to take things with a fresh look and to see something new. Has anybody noticed anything different about me? How many people have noticed until, when did you, when, who noticed when you sort of within about 20 minutes of notes of me this morning, first thing, who actually noticed the minute you walked in? Okay. What did you think? <laughs> what did you, sorry. I thought you were wearing contacts. That I'm wearing contacts, yes, thank you. Who didn't notice now until I've just mentioned it and be honest? That's interesting, isn't it? Did you not? That explains why you didn't say anything. For... Look, I've got glass cleaner. No. Interesting, isn't it? What you do and don't see in somebody else, so therefore then what you do and don't see within yourself. We could all have stuff in our lives that God is saying, that shouldn't be there. I'm not talking about sin. There's a distinct difference here. I'm not here on a condemn. This is not that sort of conversation. This is about practices in our walk with God that we think this is a good practice. And God is saying, actually, it's not a sin and it's not, it's not unclean and it's not clean, but it's not something that should be there. Nobody knows, you know, for people didn't notice, I happen to know this is my third day for wearing contacts. I've never worn contacts before in my life. Why I did not do this 20 years ago, I do not know. <laughs> this is brilliant. You don't look for a film of fog and mess and grease on my lens. I do clean them every day. But this is amazing. And I can see really clearly. A lot clearer than I ever do with glasses. So if I say I don't see you looking at me, they understand I can't. It is amazing. When you take some time out, and I was taking a risk in doing contacts. Let me explain to you. I have a, I have a, I'm not going to go into it too deeply because I just don't want to do that right now because I don't want to happen. But the idea of sticking my finger in my eye, <laughs> the lot of you probably all think, oh, that's fine. Just do it all the time. But I have a general unhealthy fear or a fear of, yeah? So I thought, this is ridiculous. I, I, I really, and then it was last week, I went to the, you're going to get another life story of Warren. I went to the optician, so I better have my two yearly eye test, discovered I only had the eye test last year. Um, but booked myself in, went for the eye test, yep, my prescription's changed again. So okay, fine. And while she's sitting there, and I'd already said to Joy about 24 hours before, do you know, I think I might try contact. She looked at me like, where's my husband? <laughs> Um, and, uh, and so I said, yeah, I'll give it a bash. And I'd already done some research, like, oh, man, you really got to do that, 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 and that. <laughs> but let's go for it. Let's, let's, let's get on with it. Let's, let's break this ritual that I've had of always wearing glasses and ordering my usual glasses, glasses with reactor lights. I can't stand bright light and bright sunshine, so reactor lights all the time. And buying sunglasses for the car, because reactor lights don't work in cars. Isn't it irritating? So sunglasses, and it doesn't come cheap, all of this stuff together. But let's try and break this routine down a bit, little bit. Let's see if we can cut down on. But let me break my fear. Let me break my normal practice. So when she said, have you ever tried contacts? No, but I'm willing to give it a bash. She goes, oh, great. And then started going through practice. What do you do for a living? And so <coughs> testimony later. Um, Mind you, that was interesting because I was in my sandals, three-quarter lengths and T-shirt. I was still on holiday mode. And so when you turn around and say, I'm a rev, they look at you a bit weird. <laughs> that may have nothing to do with what I was dressed like, just the fact that I'm a rev. Or I'm just weird. But anyway, so walked in the next week, walked in to go and sit down and, and, and to discuss contacts and what is the right ones for you. Turns out I've got really dry eyes. It's all the crying I do. <laughs> Not. So 
goes through that process with me. And by that point, I'm in my clerical collar and they all add, oh, you really are a rev. Yes, I really am. So uh, did the clerical. And the next day she says, right, I need to book you in for a day's training. Great. I thought, okay, well, another week from now. Then she turned around and she said, no, we can book you in tomorrow. I've got actually your prescription of contacts here. <sighs> oh, okay. I kid you not, there was like, hmm, I, I need time to prepare for this change in my life. Oh, let's just get on with it, shall we? Let's stop mucking about. So I walked in, uh, the gentleman, his name's Phil, really nice guy, sits in front of me, says, right, let's go through how you're going to do it. Have you looked on, on how you do it? I said, yes, I have. It looks painful. No, it's fine. So we started the uh, practice, and then in less, he said, book yourself half an hour. Well, at least 20 minutes, he said, well, you've done this three times. You seem to have this off pat. You exactly know what you're doing. And it was really easy. I thought, this is great. He said, you've got to overcome the, the initial... And I thought, yeah, so it was a couple of times, don't be wrong, I didn't go, oh yeah, ba-dumpf. <laughs> I, but I did sit there tentatively, no, oh, drop that, and they're flimsy as well, these one-day jobs. So anyway, I eventually, it's really fun, this, must override the need to close the eye. Think brain, override, dumpf, and in it goes. And then scrape it out and throw away. And it was a lot easier than I thought. And I have got in already within three days into, this is really easy. This morning I went to go and do it. And I thought, no problem. But somebody wanted to watch me. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but she wanted to see. So initially, the first right one, I thought, yes, I did this. No, I was like, dum, 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 dum. Great, brilliant. First one. <sighs> Second time, it went in, great. And then when they go and do the left eye, you see, what you've got to understand is Joy's there. <laughs> so every time I go to do it, I see her move. <laughs> and it's like somebody watching over you when you're trying to type a letter on the laptop, isn't it? You suddenly can't even spell the word and. <laughs> and that's exactly how it was, because she was watching. I thought, no, I need to. I politely, no, I didn't. I said, could you get out? <laughs> So she went, all right, so she tumbles off down and says, and then I went, no, no, oh, come on, you know how to do this, get on with it. And that was it, we're done. Point of this is actually, when we actually really take the risk and the gamble to throw something out that we've been doing for years, it's amazing what's happened. So what is the second thing that God was talking to me about whilst I was clearing out the office? In those prophecies, there was spring clean my house. And he wasn't talking about the church building. Forget the trivia. I will break the mould. And those words just would not stop resonating with me as I am spring cleaning the office. God saying, forget the trivia. I will break the mould. I know, I'm coming to that later, thank you, you're right. I'll explain that in a moment, what Carol was just saying. Spring clean my house doesn't mean when God is talking is just clearing out sin, which is what, how a lot of people register that sometimes as being. He does mean that as well, but he does the clearing out. We just have to identify it as something that is sinful. To give you, yeah, I'll come back to that later. But spring clean my house. Throw out that which is no longer of any use. Why are you hanging on to a tradition in your life? or in the church life, whatever way that looks. Spring clean it out. A way of thinking that you think about yourself. God is saying, spring it out, get rid of it. Stop thinking like that. That's negative thinking. That has not come from me. Forgetting the trivia. Stop worrying about 
the little things. Stop worrying about making mistakes. Stop hanging on to something because you never know, just in case. Stop worrying about making errors. We're all going to make them. But if we don't take a risk and jump out and forget what maybe some people think, we will never, ever take a risk. Clear out the loft. Take a risk. You might never, ever see that or need that stuff ever again. Clear out that that's in your daily routine of life that you think, just in case. If I don't read my Bible today, I will sweat and panic because God is not going to love me today. That's a just in case. I've read it just in case God doesn't want me. You're meant to read it because it just helps. It grows. God talks to you in how you can grow with him in relationship. It's not a just in case. I used to fall into the habit of, must read one Bible verse, just in case. I will break the mould. When you might well read uh, those uh, prophecies up there, that comes from the last one, I will break the mould. Got to keep our eyes focused on Jesus, I will break the mould. And we might well read that absolutely in Greenford Baptist Church, Context. If you're a visitor here this morning, I strongly encourage you to read those four prophecies at the back. But if you're, read that in context, but we forget that we are church, yes? We are Greenford Baptist Church, yes? So when God talks about breaking the mould, he's not just talking about Sunday mornings. I'll break up the way the services happen, or whatever. That's not just breaking the mould. It's also about talking breaking the mould in us. Breaking the way that we think, the way that we walk with him. Especially the way we think. Actually, today's Bible reading for me today was quite interesting. Are you a, when disaster comes, are you a half glass empty type of person or are you a half glass full faith filled type person when disaster comes? It's breaking that sort of thinking that God probably wants to do. Because I reckon there's a chunk of us in here, normally half glass empty type people, when disaster comes. We forget that God is there. And God wants to sometimes break that mould and that thinking in us. As I said earlier on, I've got new books that can't go on my shelves at the moment. The old books are there. The old needs are there. They're no longer required. I need to spend time going, don't need that one. If you suddenly hear an announcement at the front from church, me saying there's some books for you if you want them, you know I did the job. But there's things that need removing so I can put things in place. Sometimes I'm suggesting that this sort of start of this new year as such, I know it started last week, but this start that maybe some of us need to take a step out with God and maybe with one or two other fellow brother, sister, um, brothers or sisters in Christ. Take a step out to look at our lives and to say, what God are you saying needs to change within me? What practice, what tradition, what view, what way of thinking about myself or others do I need to to change that you need to change for me when I identify it so that our life can be lived fuller and freer and less messy with him Amen. take a few moments 
Talk to God for yourself just for a minute. Then I'll close in prayer. <coughs> Lord, Heavenly Father, as, uh, as we all walk out of here today, I pray for each and every one of us, Father, that most certainly not with condemnation, but Lord, that each of us will, with you, reading your word, spending time with you and others around us who we trust, Lord, that we will look at ourselves with fresh eyes, look at things in our life with fresh eyes. Like, Lord, almost like me no longer with glasses on, we see things different and more clearly. I ask for everyone in this room, including myself, you continue to change us, break the mould, help us and guide us and speak to us. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.